All right. So just a couple of quick things. We're not we're not nearly as as uh, sort of big of a group. So maybe these maybe these rules don't matter so much. But um, if you're if you're not speaking, it would be helpful if you kept yourself mute so that um, we don't pick up the noise. Um, you know between. Uh, conversations and so forth. Um, I'll do my best to try to moderate here. It's going to be pretty small, so I think it'll be pretty informal. Um, and uh, if, there's also a chat window, so in the bottom, uh, if you split, pull your mouse down, you can see the little chat window there. Um, you might well might as well pop that open. So if you have like questions while someone else is speaking, or you just want to like keep track of what's going on. Um, uh, uh, or, or, or sort of like put down an idea so that we make sure that we discuss it, just throw it in the chat window, um, and then I'll try to make sure that I monitor it um, uh, to, to make sure to bring it up for folks. Um, Does and anyone else last... Walter's, Freeman, uh, Walter's fingers to be like a scary spider? Walter's fingers are scary. What? That, hmm. it, it seems so like I have, scary I have moved the pup for work because my old one died, and it's got the camera at the bottom, which is... Okay. Design decision, sorry. All right. <laughs> um, and then if you haven't noticed that uh, in the upper right corner, you can bring your mouse up. There's a speaker view and a gallery view. The speaker view will basically show you a large picture of the person who's speaking and then gives you sort of an overview. Hi, Josh. Um, gives you sort of an overview of all of the other people in the top corner. If you switch that to gallery view, you can actually see everybody. Um, and it'll just keep sort of like going. It'll do the Brady Bunch sort of thing. Where it just keeps people in a grid, so you know it's just a uh, whichever you prefer. I like seeing everybody, so I usually use go. Uh, okay. Any questions before we get started? Okay. So uh, the thing, the topic for tonight was basically to just kind of talk about what people have done um, sort of since uh, the faculty development workshop and, and sort of talking about like how things have been going and you know um, whether the faculty development workshop sort of facilitated your um, work uh, if you will and, and if so how did it do it um, yep go first, ahead first I think uh, Josh Danny's voice was coming back fed back through into the system because you weren't muted yeah, sorry, Josh. Oh. I should have mentioned this. Uh, we kept right. on. So um, we'd like to try to keep keep, keep muted unless you're speaking, because there is a sort of feedback and then sort of the ambient noise and so forth. Yeah. Or headphones. Yeah, can help. Thanks, Hunter. Too. Yeah. So um, so I guess yeah. The question before the group is sort of um, what have you been up to since the meeting? How's that been going? And did the you know the stuff that we did at the faculty development workshop did that did that help facilitate that? Uh, and if so, how have you sort of drawn on that? Okay. So based on my gallery view, uh, just so I keep track of everything, um, I will start with Michelle because she is in the upper left corner. Um, and then Hunter, Walter, Josh, that's the order that I have it in my screen. All right. So you want to know how I've uh, implemented things that we discussed in the pickup workshop? So, um, so my, for this semester, my main goal was implementing um, Python via trinkets and Jupyter notebooks into the lab portion of the second semester uh, intro physics, calc-based. And I would say that, uh, that at the beginning of the semester, it went really well. <laughs> the students really, really love uh, the coding, and a lot of them had taken Python before, so it was fun for them. And for the students who hadn't, um, I built the exercises in a way that they didn't, like, I told them they don't have to know how to code or learn to code, but really they were learning how to code. Um, and they really enjoyed it also, but it was just uh, the only problem that we have is time. Uh, so uh, in, for our lab, we have to do everything within the time bounds of the lab. So we can have me like a pre-lab or post-lab exercise, but they're not going to be spending time outside of lab doing that. So, um, so we definitely uh, had time issues. And then once we got to circuits, I didn't have as much stuff for them to do just in general with it. So we haven't done anything 
in the past few weeks. Um, so I would say the students love it and time's an issue. A clarification question. What do you mean they took Python before? How did they do that? So, uh, so the intro to computer science class here is in the Python language. So students that are um, in a lot of different fields here, interested in engineering, that sort of thing, they're all required to take that. So uh, uh, about half my students have taken that class. So another question for you. Oh, go ahead, Hunter. Uh, Trinket is close. Or are you doing GlowScript or other trinkets like Python three or, um, and then when you're doing Jupyter, are you doing VPython? What are you doing? Right. Okay. So uh, thanks for the question because I actually divide it up. So my trinkets, I do mainly um, VPython, GlowScript, whatever uh, stuff, and then my Jupyter notebooks are pretty much straight Python. You know, with um, uh, NumPy and Matplotlib in those libraries. Have you not attempted to uh, to do VPython in Jupyter? So I have, and I've had some struggles and some successes, but my main uh, approach right now is that um, I want them, even though I tell them they are not learning how to code, I want them to kind of, uh, the, in the Jupyter Notebooks, they are looking more at how the code is working and the trinkets are generally small little exercises that go along with the lab, like, hey, look at this trinket, uh, what do you predict will happen for this or something like that. So, uh, so I just have it kind of broken up into what I want them to get out of it. So Michelle, a question I have for you is, is the, so the materials that you are using in the laboratory, um, are those materials that you are um, developing yourself? Are you drawing them from other places? How is that, how is that going? Yes, so uh, I have take, so I would say I, it's a hybrid. So I don't think I've written anything totally from scratch. I don't think I've used anything totally from our, um, pickup site, but I, I generally will get an idea from there and uh, edit it to make it uh, work with my class. So because uh, they're kind of being handheld through everything they do coding wise in this class. Um, it's mainly like fully worked notebooks where they have to step through it and change some things. Um, and it's done in a very, like I explain things very thoroughly. Um, so I definitely get ideas from what's on there and I'll take snippets of code and uh, then add a lot more just explanation. Um, and the trinkets, I have done the same thing, I guess, aside from the one that I wrote when I was there. That's the only one I wrote from scratch. Do you find that they're, um, do they like mostly access these trinkets on their own laptops and have you found any tech problems with this? Yes, so the only problem I've found is uh, sometimes things getting a little laggy and I have, and it seems to be, uh, so using the Trinket with uh, vPython, something that is interactive, like dragging something around, sometimes I see a lag uh, with that. And it seems to be students that are on their laptops, so maybe the Wi-Fi connection, but I, I don't actually know why, um, that happens. So sometimes, like they'll try to drag something, but because it gets laggy, they'll they'll lose it. Does that does Trinket support um, drag, like click and drag options? Yes. Really. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Michelle was the one who showed me how easy that was to do at the workshop. I remembered it being a vPython thing where you're dragging static charges, yes. but I didn't remember that it was Trinket. It's yes, that was a trinket, yeah. Okay. So another, just a follow-up question, uh, I guess, um, was there stuff that you drew on from that faculty development workshop that helped with this, or, or is it, I mean, the one of the things I know about Davidson is they're very supportive of computing uh, in the classroom, right? Um, so where, where does the support you're getting come from? 
So first of all, if I didn't go to the workshop, I probably wouldn't have done any of this this semester at all because it's my first semester here. And uh, so if I didn't have, first of all, the materials, so I had a, I knew, I knew of a resource I could go to that I wasn't writing things from scratch because I wouldn't have had time to do that. And then also from playing with Trinket there, and you guys convinced me that VPython uh, is good. So I think that I took a lot out of it in terms of content, learning, VPython. I didn't even know about Trinket before the workshop. So, so all of those things were a huge benefit. So I have a question. If your students have, have exposure to Python before, my, I guess, hesitancy to go down the vPython rabbit hole, I suppose, um, you know, I think I'm still going to in Physics 211 when I teach intro physics next semester, but my past reticence to go the, the vPython route is there's a whole lot of magic required to set up the, the graphics rendering. And, and by magic, what I mean is stuff that beginning computing students won't understand the function of. So my question is, do you find that your students are able to look beyond the lines of code that do things they don't understand and, and see, oh, okay. What are you talking about? Can you please explicate the magic lines of code? Sure. So um, let me, well, I, I could go and pull something up off my Glow Scripts guy site. But for instance, things that set up the, you know, creating a window to draw in of, of such and such size and creating, you know, certain objects with, uh, you know, syntax calls of, right, I want a sphere with these parameters and all of the things that are non physicsy and that are specific uh, graphics calls for which you would need a lot of syntactical background to write correctly. So for me, because I'm pretty much giving them most of the code, and so for example, the, the trinket with vPython that you guys all saw, I'll set one up where it's like four positive charges oriented in a certain direction, and I'll say, okay, make one a negative charge. So I make them through the different steps, learn what the parameters to certain functions are. Okay. Um, uh, but but it seems that even the ones that have had uh, computing classes before in this class, they're not really questioning so much why. Uh, but it might just be because of how I've organized, because I'm not asking them to, like, start something from scratch. Um, so, I mean, uh, so I, I asked for feedback on the Python stuff, and I didn't get anything negative on using vPython or the Jupyter Notebooks. So... I mean, that, that's the right outcome, right? You don't, want, you, know, you don't want them to focus on, you know, little fiddly computer science things. You want them to think algorithmically and think about physics, so... Right, right. And of course, I mean, in computational physics and in other courses, they'll get into details. Walter, for, for me this semester, uh, I last, last week um, in lab, uh, they used a, a glow script simulation in intro uh, calc based DNM. Um, and there, um, I gave them something that was working and had them make some, some changes to it involving physics stuff. Um, and I didn't point out those lines of code at the beginning, and they didn't ask, and I don't think they looked at them. Okay, okay, nice. <clears throat> so, uh, I just want to notice, I don't know if people probably did notice, but Tony's joined us. Um, so welcome, Tony. Um, Tony, what we're doing is we're going sort of through, um, we started with Michelle um, talking about uh, what have you been up to since the meeting, how's it been going, and sort of what you might have drawn on from the faculty development workshop or even at your home institution to, you know, do that stuff. So I think um, given, the, given the time, we'll probably go to Hunter now and ask him. And it's been, you know, we've had a little... Uh, back and forth. So if you have questions, just just kind of jump in with questions of that person. Um, and what I'll what I'll hope to do is by by nine o'clock get through everybody. So okay. maybe give everybody about ten minutes or so. So uh, Hunter, same question to you. Okay, um, I've I'm all in, and I've been doing a few things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so first of all, we had a course ad deadline that uh, was. October something or other and we made that so we created a two credit sophomore level uh, lab course for that will be required for all physics majors and minors 
And the inspiration was Kinder and Nelson's introduction to computational modeling for physical science, whatever that one is, with the um, Mandelbrot set on the front. And Aaron Titus introduced me to that book. I bought it, it was only $25, and I, and I formed a working group with three students, three upper division students, who were gonna do independent study with me. And so we meet, we have a regular class time that we meet, and I basically added to my teaching load um, by having this meeting. But we're burning through that book, um, and I'm very pleased with it. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm happy that we're now gonna have an official, you know, channeling all the physics students through uh, some kind of Python training. <clears throat> Uh, meanwhile, I'm teaching two courses. Uh, one is a sophomore level waves and heat course. So quote unquote, third semester intro calc based. And I have made some trinkets that I've used and I've um, embedded them, you know, in some cases with, uh, with code and output side by side and in other cases with output only embedded them into my course management system. And um, put them into this kind of lessons tool that I don't really know how to use, but in any case, it puts the trinkets in sequentially. And what I've done is just say, <clears throat> you know, bring your computer, that's another problem. Bring your computer <laughs> to class, you know, share if you can, and just open this, open these simulations and have them there while you do tutorials in introductory physics. And so I'm trying to design trinkets that are as closely aligned with the tutorials as possible. So what I have is um, some harmonic motion, uh, superposition and reflection of pulses, and then I have another set of trinkets for um, uh, my own worksheet called Applications of Superposition, which is Standing Waves and Beats, and that's what I presented on in the workshop. <clears throat> so it's, you know, the manipulating the trinkets so far has been totally opt-in with no accountability. And the idea is that, you know, I sort of have come to believe in um, educating the student community while the students actually pass through the student community, that there can be incremental development of the student community as a whole, like as an organism while the cells, you know, are born and die type of thing. Um, so, you know, I'm introducing uh, the trinkets and the Python when there's no, there's no reason to get angry about, you know, um, or frustrated with the effect of this on your grade. You're, they're just sort of having the opportunity to, to mess with the trinkets to sort of help check their answers on the tutorials and things like that. <clears throat> um, meanwhile, oh, also I learned that um, Double E's and math majors have this one computer science course that's required at our university that's taught in C++ and it's of limited use to develop, you know, developing skills with Python. And so I think we, we kind of made a bold move in our, in the physics department compared to like engineering and math, where we're not going to rely on computer science to do the work for us. We're going to teach our own course. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm teaching quantum at the 4,000 level. And I quickly, <clears throat> we started with trinkets and quickly outgrew them, not because the students understood everything about them, but because there were things that I needed programs to do that trinket couldn't do. And I expressed some of my journey with that on the, on the Slack channel. <clears throat> uh, we've had some growing pains also with, with uh, Jupiter, you know, getting the right version and getting, just knowing what, version of Python we were doing and um, being able to import the libraries and understanding how to, you know, every time you want to restart the animation, you got to restart the kernel first, you know, so we learned kind of the hard way, but now we know how to do that. Um, and most of what I'm giving them is programs that already work and I'm asking them to augment them with some time dependence or, um, you know, maybe I'm giving them like a single wave and I want them to do some superposition so they're sort of making another wave and adding them together. Um, but uh, that's what I've done so far. So that, that being quantum and waves, 
you know, I haven't really used material that's on the pickup website because I don't think there's very much there in those topic areas. And that's fine. I, I'm mostly converting programs that I already wrote last spring in idle and adapting them for Jupyter. And I now, you know, like this morning I adapted a program for Jupyter in like 10 minutes because I now know all of the fixes that need to be made. Um, and I uploaded it to the course management system and had, had it ready for student use. So, oh, and one more update. I have a student who wants to do a research credit with me next semester. And he, he really wants to build his own computing experience. So he wants to write trinkets for the, the, the mechanics tutorials. So he's gonna to try to keep pace with the mechanics tutorials and introductory physics um, while that course operates and um, possibly, I mean, we'll see if we can build a semester's worth of trinkets, you know, next semester for mechanics. So Hunter, I have a comment and a question. So the, the comment well, is the, the, so you, you have this course that you're teaching or that I guess not your, well, maybe you are, you're going to be teaching it, but you're, uh, you're not going to rely on the computer science departments to teach your students how to do computing. And right. So we recently um, required, we had, we had a new department that was founded this uh, computational math science and engineering department. And okay. we recently acquired, we required our physics majors to take both of their introductory courses. So, so okay. CMSE 201 and 202, which are essentially introductions to modeling and data science. Um, cool. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, I think it'll be super interesting to see where that ends up going. But the, how did you find the room in the curriculum for that? What's that? How did you find the room in the curriculum? We actually don't require nearly as much uh, physics of our majors to get their degree as most other large institutions do. Um, okay. So, like for example, our students um, can graduate uh, our major with only taking one semester worth of classical and one semester worth of E and M. Um, so uh, there's there's kind of a lot of how much quantum? Uh, I think one semester, maybe maybe two, but I I suspect it's one. <clears throat> kind of like one of each of the of the upper level courses and then some yeah. courses. So I think we, we have a lot of um, like core curriculum requirements that are just totally out of our control. But I think what we ended up doing was we dropped we 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 dropped the the sort of suggested requirement which all which all students had, which was taking like. CSE 20 something or another um, and just replaced it with that and then added one. So I think we actually only ended up adding one, one okay. course. Um, so I want to, I want to say one other thing, which is that we discovered that when, remember when I talked about dropping chemistry as a requirement, degree requirement, well, engineering, the school of engineering has already pressured the chemistry department into condensing two semesters of general chemistry into one for their engineering degree. So for us to piggyback on that is uh, just a drop in the, in the bucket for chemistry, for us, for physics to join. So I think we're gonna do that to make room in the degree. Cool. Uh, the, then the question I had for you, which was, was um, um, what's, the, what's the rationale behind aligning your, uh, some of your computational activities with the Washington tutorials? What are you hoping to get out of that? Um, we are trying to, so, <clears throat> I shouldn't say we. My intuition is that um, it will help bring balance to the force. You know, that, that we have too much, that there is too much emphasis on the tutorials right now in our introductory course. And there's too much of a sense among the students doing them that it is not real physics. And the part of the reason it's not real physics to them is because they're not manipulating numbers. But if you are manipulating a computer program, you are manipulating numbers um, because the computer is manipulating numbers. Um, and so I'm just testing it out, just exploratory in an exploratory way. Um, I'm not gonna regret you know, the effort that, that we put into making trinkets for all the mechanics tutorials. Um, it's, I'm just sort of gonna try to keep my ear to the ground and see if it improves student affect uh, in terms of um, the tutorials. I, I recently had this kind of epiphany that the tutorials, 
it doesn't matter that the tutorials are hard. What matters to the students is that the tutorials don't look hard. They don't look STEMI. They don't look elite because they're not using symbolic, you know, uh, representations that would impress their friends. You know, it looks like, I think it looks like it's dumbed down. And I think that they don't appreciate that the form of it is actually pretty abstract and challenging. You know. I'm similar. I'm, so I'm teaching uh, astronomy this semester and you know, this is, a, this is astronomy 101. There is, you know, most of my students can't even do algebra. And uh, I, have, I have similar experiences with the tutorials that the students, I think, often... Are you talking about astronomy stuff. tutorials? Yeah, yeah, the Ed Prather astronomy tutorials. Right, okay. And the students have a similar experience of not realizing that beneath the non-threatening presentation lies actual real meaty reasoning skills that they need to right. take. Yeah, that's very, very interesting, Hunter. I mean, I, I think it would be interesting to see how that ends up playing out because I think there's, there's a, there's an, there's a sort of added component of, of the, um, the visualization that seems like it could really help facilitate that conceptual reasoning that the tutorials are trying to get at. Yeah. I really like the idea of, of computational tutorials. I mean, I think, you know, what you said, this idea of, uh, okay, let's, you know, we know that the theory is, is a significant part of the physics and the, that the numerics is not that big of a deal, but you're having the students work in a professional STEM mode where you, <clears throat> you use human brains on the theory and you use computer brains on the numerics. So in, in one way, it parallels what they're going to do in the future. And I think it's also, I mean, I, I think it's great. That's it's wonderful. Other questions for Hunter? Am I hearing any skepticism from you, Danny, on this? Me? Yeah. No, no, I, 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 think, I think it's, I, so I hadn't, I hadn't thought about um, sort of aligning the computational activities with, um, you know, existing sort of activities that are known to work relatively well. And I think, I think it's interesting um, I, the reason I asked about the rationale is because I was I was interested to know, you know, why why you want to align them. We don't use the tutorials here, uh, right? So I don't really know. You know, we actually most well we use them in Colorado, but I wasn't involved with the intro courses, so I'm not really sure what students' perceptions of the tutorials are. And so your your rationale to me makes a lot of sense, um, right? Because yeah. it seems like worksheet work, right? That's what it is. It's worksheet work. Right, and it's not only that, it's words. And, um, you know, I remember, um, I think it's just an over, it's a, it's a very powerful message that I think some of the students get from the tutorials. The fact that it's words, they're like, this should not be hard. Why is this so hard? You know, but I, the faculty just don't, we have a blind spot on that. Like, why do you think it shouldn't be hard? You know, so. So did you say that you were, that you did a wave superposition uh, trinket? Yes. Um, would you like to share it with me? Sure. Okay, that falls in line with uh, what I'm doing next week. <laughs> Put it on okay. slide, Hunter. Okay. Um, can I make a comment? So um, we have a, burgeoning learning assistant program at UCLA that I'm, I'm using right now 12 learning assistants in the mechanics course that I'm teaching and something you said Hunter gave me a great idea which is um, using learning assistants to write trinkets for students in the class because I think the learning assistants themselves will learn some programming which is great but they're also ideal people to write trinkets because they have taken the class before so they understand the physics to some extent and they and they interact with the students a lot so they know what they're confused on and i'd love to get my la's to write some trinkets for that class and i think i'm gonna try to do sorry, that sorry could you define learning assistant for me oh yeah sure um in our case we have this program where students who have taken a class in the past undergraduate students can sign up for a course that is a full four unit class. It's um, officially, an, I think, upper division physics credit, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I have to check on that. And they go through training on pedagogy for facilitating group work and discussions. And they meet with me once a week 
and they hold office hours. They do a lot of the things that TAs do except for grading. And um, they get credit for this. And then we actually have funding now to have students return as, as paid learning assistants uh, if, if they, we think they did a great job. So that's, that's at least at our school what we're doing. I'm very interested to hear the outcome of this experiment because I'm teaching computational physics in the fall and I teach intro physics in the, the spring. And one of my best computational physics students is a sophomore level um, physics education major. And she's very good and I may try to recruit her. So I, I typically recruit learning assistants for my intro class out of my computational physics class. Uh, just because it's a convenient source of people who are good at physics who you know know me and i may try to recruit her as someone to to help develop things like this and you know i might might try to talk to the physics department and see if we can do an independent study and get her credit or talk to the education department and get her credit for something she needs so i'm very interested to hear your outcomes there great stuff all right, so I think uh, we'll shift to Walter and ask the, let me see if I can repeat the question. Uh, so what have you been up to since the meeting? How's it going? And you know, what did you draw from the um, FDW or from your um, local institution to sort of help that work? Well, so my, my response is going to be sort of atypical. I'm teaching a, an introductory astronomy class where the students, you know, if you ask them to Okay, wait a minute. So, so the force depends inversely on the square of the radius. This is just, you know, you, you, that's very difficult for them. So this is a general education astronomy class. It's very humanities oriented, you know, having to write, write papers on, on astronomical culture. And, you know, it, it's a great experience, but it's not the sort of thing to which computational integration really applies. It's not a STEM class, really. Um, the, and I'm also teaching a computational physics class where... Uh, so this class I'm teaching very similar to the way that I taught it last semester. Um, the department and the students really liked what I did last semester. They gave me an award for it. So I'm like, I'm not going to change it. I've got enough on my plate already. I've got these 600 astronomy students who are trying to eat my face off. Um, so that class, I am, uh, so actually tomorrow, I'm going to give them an assignment. So if you look on the pickup website, I wrote a long exercise set on the vibrating string. Um, that is going to be a three-week project for my computational physics students. So um, I, can, uh, I can give you a link to the pickup website if you'd like, or I can give you a link to the assignment that I gave last year. Does, does anybody want those links? Uh, Walter, go ahead and uh, drop them in the, uh, the Slack channel here. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, I'll do that after I'm done. Uh, well... Yeah, no worries. Don't, don't, you don't have to do it now, obviously, but yeah, right. that's a good way of keeping track of it for all of us. Sure, sure. So that, that exercise that I'm, I'm actually pretty proud of, you know, I, I wrote that as kind of an audition for, for pickup. And um, the, I'm doing some, so I, I want to introduce the thing that I, I want feedback from you guys on, which is there's a common pathology that has been identified by several people in physics major training. And, and other, other STEM major training as well, but specifically physics majors. And it's the ability to internalize what exponents mean. So there's this constellation of skills that all go together that everybody assumes that someone else has taught the students and no one ever gets around to it, which is to truly internalize what a logarithm means, what an exponent means, what power law scaling is, what a log log plot tells you, and most crucially, what a Taylor series is and what it does for you. So all of these ideas are related, right? They're related by this idea of understanding exponential dependence. And nobody ever really teaches this, not even in grad school. I remember hearing some of my, um, the, the graduate students at Syracuse uh, lamenting that there was this problem on the, the calls that they couldn't do because, you know, or, or it was lamenting something in... Um, his stat met class. He said, you know, there's this thing and this thing. And, and then the professor expands the numerator to second order and the denominator to first order. And I know what a Taylor series is, but I don't know why he did that. Um, and this is a good student. So I have, I've noticed that in computational physics, there is a lot of um, power series behavior, you know, power series dependence on step size and stuff like that. So I decided, you know, this is... I'm going to teach this as a, a secondary learning objective in my computational physics class. So we make plots of uh, log log plots of error versus step size and 
um, we're going to, when we do the vibrating string, make log log plots of deviation from ideal period as a function of amplitude, because uh, it's, it's really nonlinear, and you see those nonlinearities when you do it numerically, which is really cool. But I have, I said, you know, I'm gonna, just for grins, make an inventory, a, a force concept inventory style inventory um, on understanding Taylor series and understanding power, power law reasoning. Um, I'm going to paste this into the, uh, the Zoom chat if anybody wants to go take a look at it. So I gave this to my students as a pretest, and I'm going to give it to them as a post-test. Uh, kind of FCI style, you know, I don't claim that this is any sort of research vetted instrument, it's just one that I wrote for my own edification, and if anybody cares, then I'll work on, you know, getting it, getting other people to, to look at it. So I wrote this thing, and the pretest results were abysmal. I mean, they basically nobody knew what a log log plot was, nobody knew what a Taylor series was, it was terrible. Uh, which is what I expected, you know, I knew this was a problem going in. But the students are getting good at this, you know, they're, they're getting better. They, they see that, um, you know, oh, so, so this straight line lies above this straight line, so that means, okay, you look at the slope and figure out the, the scaling. Um, mm -hmm. the separation tells me the factor. You, know, you can see that the plot for the midpoint rule lies below the plot for the trapezoid rule, because the error differs by a factor of two in the large, uh, the small bin size limit. So, um, all these things that I'm talking about, the reason I'm talking about this is, in a computational physics class, there's not really a computational integration challenge because that's what you're already doing, right? Um, so I'm teaching the students, uh, so we're using C um, because I feel like you need to know a, a language like C or, or Fortran um, to be competitive in the job market, among other things. Um, you know, many of my students actually are computer science students. This is the interesting thing. Many computer science students saw the simulations that I used as lecture demos last semester when they took intro physics with me. So you've got to take intro physics to get a CS degree. They, they saw the simulations that I did as lecture demos and signed up for this class wanting to know how to make those. And maybe half of those people have dropped the class as they found out that it was a serious amount of work. And the other half are loving it, which was very interesting to me. Um, I have one of my students in my computational physics class is doing the assignment in Java. One of them is doing all the assignments in Python because they know these languages and I've, they're kind of making this point, the pickup point, that computational skills are language agnostic. Um, so that's going on. I'm actually, uh, the students, they're now beginning to really sink their teeth into the meaty physics things. So let me see if pick up screen sharing works. How do I do this? Or I'll zoom screen, screen sharing. On the uh, bottom there, there should be a share screen uh, button right in the middle. So if you, if you scroll down or move your mouse down. Either. So I actually have not spawned the window that I want to share. So I'm going to do that. One second. Hmm. Now you can, I guess you can see my whole screen, but uh, this window with the, uh, the little planets orbiting each other, um, the three body problem, it was their homework for last week. So they're doing this and they're getting some very interesting knowledge about the phenomenology of orbits that they didn't have. And this is the really interesting pedagogy thing to me is I haven't lectured them or, or presented to them the phenomenology of orbits. I've just said, this is Newton's second law of motion. This is Newton's law of gravity. Now go simulate it. Uh, you know, we can just as a, as a First thing, well, we can figure out the conditions for a circular orbit of Earth around the sun. So do that one just to make sure your code's working and then make an elliptical orbit, you know, play with it, explore the phenomenology. And now they're doing, I, I didn't tell them what initial conditions to use. I just said, you know, try to make uh, a planet with a moon going around the sun, going around the star. And, um, they get to investigate the phenomenology on their own, and I'm very interested to see what they write in their reports. Um, another thing that I have to, to talk about, though, is, let me kill this, this guy. 
and go back to the Zoom thing. Oh, is it even sharing my screen? I can still see your screen. Oh, okay. So let me then kill screens. Can you see me now? Not yet. Okay, how do I unshare screen? Uh, if you go back to Zoom, um, you have to click, I believe, share screen and actually wait, I can stop it. Ha! Ah! Oh, okay. No, wait, no, I can't. Yeah, when I click share screen, it just tells me the, the options that I have to share again. So I can share a screen really quickly and then uh, I think I can- Oh, there it is, at the top. Oh, did you get it? Yep, there it there is. Okay. Um, Apparently I can share a screen and kill your screen sharing, which is interesting and yet, and it seems like an abuse of power. <laughs> So yeah, that, that simulation is, um, that's what they did last week. But the department is actually very, very interested in talking to me about computational integration. Um, the director of undergraduate studies is significantly on board, as is the, the department chair. <clears throat> and they want to talk to me, I think actually tomorrow, um, about doing computational integration in the next upper division StatMac class because that is a class where the phenomenology is often hidden behind impenetrable Taylor series that nobody really knows how, or uh, um, series that nobody really knows how to sum. And it's really difficult to, to grok the phenomenology in StatMac without having to dive through a whole lot of math that some of our students aren't prepared to do. I mean, I certainly wasn't at, at, at that place in my career. So I'm gonna talk to him about doing a very, uh, large-scale integration <clears throat> and one of the models that I have in mind This is something I'd like to get feedback on is the idea of a computational lab that goes with a class where um, They have activities possibly meeting at a different time taught by a different faculty member uh, To okay now let's apply the things you've learned in your class where you do theory and let's go model something on the computer and do an experiment It's just a simulated experiment rather than a, a physical one and I, I'm going to propose this to them as a way to get around the, the professor buy-in thing. I, I thought about that. <clears throat> and at one point I had um, the scheme of uh, having, an upper, having a lab class go with each of the upper division core courses. I like that. I could avoid the buy-in problem. Um, but uh, what we settled on as a department was that it would be better to just uh, force all of the students through it at a sophomore level. And then, then at some point we'll communicate to the faculty, hey, this is what all the students are able to do. Please take advantage of it. Yeah. In the courses. And I'll admit significant ulterior <laughs> motives here in proposing this because, you know, I'm, I'm still angling for a permanent position at Syracuse and if I propose some sort of scheme that, that involves something taught by a separate faculty member, I can say, hey, you should keep me around and let me do this because I'm useful. <laughs> you want to make yourself indispensable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I know I've rambled for a while, but um, yeah, so astronomy has no computation and computational physics is exactly what it says on the tin. It's using C and um, Animations like the one I just showed you to do various physical systems. We're doing the vibrating string next for the, their final project They will do either end body molecular dynamics the um, either the pseudo ideal gas with the 12-6 uh, potential or they will do um, Simulations of a vibrating membrane in three dimensions with not with physical nonlinearities and Students who really get into that can do some some pretty fantastic things so, Walter, let me suggest that um, if, if you want feedback on particular activities and stuff, that we, we try to make sure that that goes into Slack in addition to someplace here, because there might be people who have not been able to join that mm -hmm. could have to, could give you feedback or, or talk to you about it. I'm thinking of, of Sean in particular. I know that he's, he, and I, he and I have talked a little bit about activities for like advanced e &M, but I think that could be like having that threaded conversation there might help others too. Yeah, I'll do that. I've been sort of uh, completely buried by uh, my just trying to give 600 students individual attention is, is a life consuming <laughs> endeavor. Any other questions for Walter? Okay, uh, Josh, maybe we'll uh, go with you.
Uh, if I can say, so I do need to, to run. I, I had to leave rehearsal to come here and we have a concert with a symphony in two weeks. So. Oh. Well, think, thank, yeah, thanks for joining Walter. Thanks for, for uh, getting involved. Of course, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, this pickup pick up is fantastic and I'm, I'm so glad to be working with you all. Appreciate it. Cool. Enjoy yeah. your rehearsal. Will do. Okay, Josh. Okay, so this quarter I'm teaching two computational physics seminars. One that is um, concurrent with mechanics for scientists and engineers, intro mechanics, and the other one that is with math methods, which is an upper division math methods class for physics majors. And the seminars meet uh, for two hours every week. And there are 15 to 16 students per seminar. They're honor seminars. So each of them was an opt-in kind of thing. I sent out a survey to all my students before the course began and asked for how many people were interested in taking a seminar. And I have to say that it was pretty amazing how many people were. In my math methods class, over 90% of 85 students said they wanted to take the seminar. And there are only 16 spots. And in the mechanics class, I think it was around 60% said that they were interested in the seminar. So there's really no problem, was no problem for me finding interested people, which is encouraging. Can you say again how the seminar was defined? Sure. Uh, each week they meet in a room that's kind of like a lab style setting. And um, they work on some computational problems. I was going to elaborate on this too, which I can just do right now. Basically, they come to a room and they pair up with someone and they work on a Jupyter notebook for two hours. The topic of the notebook is typically related to the course material in some way. So for mechanics, for example, there was a notebook about projectile motion where they had to find the range of projectiles on various hills, for example. Um, and they, I've structured things so that Every group contains one programmer who's self-described as being somewhat expert in programming and one person who self-describes as being a complete novice in programming. And that's been an interesting experiment that I can speak about the results of. Um, but that's, that's the structure. Is that what you were looking for? I guess I also wanted to know what, what the students thought they were uh, opting into. Um, so it's a one unit course that only students who are signed up for either of those two, either the mechanics course or math methods course are allowed to sign up for. And it's graded. Um, the course itself that they're signed up for is either four or five units. So basically, you know, you tell them if you're interested, you can sign up. It's an honor seminar. Um, they can sign up for this honor seminar optionally. I tell them it's only a two hour week for commitment. There's no homework or anything like that. They just come and do the, do the lab style um, notebooks and, and they get a credit for it. Why do you think it was so appealing? I asked for comments and I only got a few of them about that question. So I'm not entirely sure what it is for most people, but I will say that for the people who commented, there was a very wide range. One person commented that he believes that learning about physics in a computational setting helps him understand the physics because he thinks algorithmically typically anyway. And so he wanted to take the seminar for that reason. And generally speaking, it seems like Students are excited about the prospect of learning Python, which is what I'm using for the, for the course, because there's some perception that Python is a relevant language and a useful skill to have in the workforce. Um, so I think that's part of it too. Um, so anyway, uh, I've been doing this for the past few weeks and I've had some, I've done a lot of experimentation with the format. Uh, I wrote something at the pickup workshop, which was an exercise or a, a Jupyter notebook for learning Euler's method for numerically integrating ODEs. And I have to say that interestingly, that has been the most successful, uh, <laughs> the most successful activity. And I think part of it was that I got a lot of really good feedback from, from people who have done this before. Um, so 
maybe also from our discussions with each other, I got some really good feedback and I think that has helped a lot. Um, I will say that one thing I'm interested in getting feedback from, from other people on is, so I've tried this thing of mixing a reasonably good programmer with a novice programmer so that they'll either help each other or cause the programmer who knows a lot to slow down and explain things to the other person or whatever. And I've gotten mixed results. Like in some groups, the person who's kind of good at programming will get really frustrated and want to go really fast. And in other groups, I had this one group where the person who knows Python pretty well is like really into explaining everything to the, to his partner, which is amazing. They have these like super awesome long conversations where he's learning things, he's teaching things. They're looking up random Python functions online and he's telling her what like recursion means and all this, all this stuff. Like it's totally beyond what I wanted them to talk about, but it's awesome. And then there's another group where this guy is just like, I literally, when I walk around, and there's an LA there too, when I walk around and ask him like, so what have you guys been doing? He looks completely disinterested. And he's told me that he already knows all this stuff, even though he definitely doesn't. And he looks really frustrated and his partner is slower than he is. And so I'm, I'm interested to know, you know, ways of, improving that because I think it's valuable to have that mixture of skill sets, but there's obviously challenges to that too. So if people have ideas for that, I'm, I'm very much open to feedback. So I will say um, that because I do my Python stuff in a lab, they're already working in, they're working in self-selected groups. And uh, I, I found that those groups, we have different types of pairing. Like sometimes there's an expert and, a novice that sometimes there's people that both don't know what they're doing, but uh, those groups seem to work together really well, I think because they were self-selected. So they knew that they wanted to work with the other person. So, um, I mean, I don't know if that's the best answer, but, uh, but it may, but if you have someone who's really good and doesn't want to help somebody else, then they probably would want to work with someone who's more of an expert than a novice. Or something like that. Have you rotated any of the pairs, Josh, or do you have any uh, plan to? Yeah, actually, my learning assistant suggested rotating them, and we did. Um, this last week, we rotated so that, in fact, we tried this thing of pairing the more expert people together and the novices together and see what effect that would have. And um, I can't say that I've noticed an enormous difference, actually, interestingly. Like, I I don't know. I can't tell, basically. Um, it still seems like in a lot of the groups, they're, they're either there's someone frustrated with the other person or they have a great dynamic. It's kind of, kind of strange. I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. But. Can I ask to what extent they're working together? Like, do they have one computer and two people? They have one computer and two people. And actually, another thing I've been doing is so for the first session, I required the expert programmer not to touch the keyboard at all. Um, so <laughs> this was doubly frustrating for, for that person. <laughs> yeah, but, that, would be frustrating. Um, that was just, you know, I was interested to see the outcome of that. Um, but uh, now what I've tried is I have points in time during the seminar Well, I'll, or I'll say out loud, okay, now switch programmers. And so it, like they, they are both required to touch the keyboard for a, a certain amount, basically half of the time. Um, and so I'm trying to structure it so that they, they're required to work together on some level in the sense that they need to cooperate to finish the task. But of course, like, you know, as I've said, this leads to some frustration. So, you know, um, it, there's a, it seems, there seems to be a trade-off that's unavoidable, but I don't, I don't really know if that's true. So uh, our solution to, the, to your problem, I think, I mean, not to say that this would work for you, but in our department is to promote teamwork as an explicitly taught and, and valued um, ability you know, that employers are looking for. So I would say if you think you're such a hot programmer and you're so frustrated with your dumb partner, then you're just not very good at teamwork, you know, do better. Um, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say it like that, but because I'm nicer, but um, you know, it's something that they need to learn how to do. And, and 
<clears throat> like part of interviews are, uh, I mean, from what I understand, because I never had a real job, part of industrial interviews are about trying to find out if someone is a real jerk and doesn't have any patience for explaining their work to other people. So as we, we just have a lot in our department to build a spirit of, of uh, cooperation and, and working together. So does, does that mean on a practical level that you, you have, you expose students to a lot of um, like explaining its importance or are there more embedded things in the structure of what they're doing and like the activities that, that supports that idea? Like do you tell them a lot teamwork's really important or is there some other more subtle thing that's going well, on? We, we, we tell them and we direct them to do it a lot. Um, and also, I mean, it, I don't know, they, it catches on. They, they, our LA program is, is, um, overwhelming, you know, in terms of its presence in the physics department, it's, it sort of has ruined everything, you know? Um, and so they're, you know, sometimes they need explicit encouragement, like, okay, the homework is really hard. Well, the homework is meant to be too hard for you, you know, for any, individual. So you're supposed to work together, you know, and there are other structural things that happen in upper division courses. I have students turning in their work electronically uh, in the course management system in a way that it's visible to the other students, you know, so they're seeing each other's work. They're expected to look at it. I'm counting on them to look at it, you know, so it's not about keeping secrets and, and climbing over others and doing the best you can individually, you know, so. I see. Yeah, I would just amplify what Hunter had said, uh, particularly about the teamwork aspect. I mean, one of the big things that we've, we've done in our intro course um, to sort of ensure that there's some um, equal use or equal engagement with the computer is to tie the, the, the um, the group work aspect and the sort of the teamwork and facilitation to a student's assessment uh, in class that day, right? So that they're getting both feedback about how they're doing and they're getting some um, uh, numeric uh, score associated with that. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in more about that, I'm happy to tell you about it. I mean, uh, some other time because it, it, we found that that by doing that kind of formative feedback with some scoring seems to bring everyone into it, right? So even the people who are, who could, let's say, breeze through the problems, um, right? They're being held accountable for the understanding that the group has. I see. Yeah, I've definitely considered um, some, some sort of grading scheme in which their grade depends on the grade of, of others that they're working with in some way. But yeah, I've, I've never tried that and I don't really know anything about how the outcome of that would be. So I, I would be interested to hear like, you know, what your experiences with that, with that have been. I'll just add one thing that what, one of the things that I do at the intro level is I have group. So I have two phase exams where they're individual and then group. Well, when they do the group exam, I mean, there are different ways to do it, but in my class, everyone still gets their own group exam grade. Like you don't have to, you don't have to agree to agree within your group, you can, you're just discussing the questions and getting their input and then you're still putting your own answers and there's no risk. Like it doesn't, it can't possibly lower your grade. I have a, I have a group exam guarantee. You know, that if you, if your grade were to go down, I'll just apply your individual grade twice, you know, but it's just, it's, to me, it's been very compelling. The level of engagement, you know, that they have with each other during a group exam just very pleasing. It's like, oh, I wish every day could be like this. The, the urgency of figuring out each of these questions, you know. So I'm happy with that as another device. So yeah, I can't, I can't recall if I was supposed to speak about other things. And one other thing I didn't say is I've been using Sage Math Cloud for this um, honors thing. And I have to say the interface of Sage Math Cloud is a little bit clunky at times. Like I, I don't know, it's a little not necessarily the most intuitive thing, but 
but I also have to say that it is nice to be able to, for example, go into a student's notebook simultaneously with that student and help them with code, for example, um, which you can do. And, you know, the grading um, functionality is pretty nice and stuff. So I would say I'm, I'm reasonably positive about Sage Math Cloud if, if someone is interested in doing a cloud-based course management thing for computing. Is it, how python -y is it? Uh, it, you can, you can code in Python. I mean, basically you have access to a Unix, a Linux terminal when you're in Sage Math Cloud. So you can technically combi compile anything you want. For example, you just have like a virtual machine somewhere, but, um, there's a lot of built in Pythonic stuff. Like there's Jupyter that comes standard with it. They have a, a bunch of different Python distributions installed standard. You can, uh, edit either in the Jupyter Notebook or you can edit in another window and, and compile your code. You can, um, you can even write in Markdown in separate files. You can write in LaTeX in separate files. It's kind of like a, a cloud-based, all-encompassing computing platform, which is, I think, what they want it to be. So. I remember you talking about it in Wisconsin, and I think it was just like way too much for me to handle at that point. So. Yeah. I'm feeling comfortable with Jupiter and like maybe in another round I'd be ready, you know? Yeah, it's also kind of in its, in its infancy. So I feel kind of like I'm a beta tester at some points. So I don't know if I'd recommend it to somebody who, you know, like, even like myself, <laughs> it turns out, who has a big course load to teach. So, you know, I, I can definitely keep you updated on how I feel about it. But at, at this point, I would say if you're comfortable with what you're doing, then just keep doing that. Cool. Any other questions for, for Josh? Uh, I'm sensitive to the time, so I want to make sure that Tony has a, a moment to share. Okay. Uh, so, Tony, you, you're aware of the question, and so we'll let you go. Um, and you're muted right now, so you probably want to unmute yourself. Oh, so yeah, I had one question for Josh. The, the, the students you're teaching for the last course that you talked about, who are they and uh, do they, I just wanted to find the demographics. Are they uh, computer science or, who, who, I just wanted to know that. Um, for the, there's one honor seminar that I'm running alongside mechanics and those students are really mixed. There's computer science majors, engineers, physicists, all that stuff. And the other one is for math methods for physics. So it's basically only physics majors. And I will say something really interesting about that now that you mention it, which is um, in the first week, I gave both, both sessions the same uh, Jupyter notebook to do. Um, and most of the students in the, in the one for math methods are, you know, like sophomores, juniors, or seniors. And the students in the other one are all freshmen and very mixed. And the ones in the... And the mechanics sort of lower level one, like breathed through the tutorial. Like they did everything correctly really, really fast. And the physics majors uh, took about double the time. And I don't know if it's because they were just more detail oriented and something like that, which seemed to be sort of the case. But also it might have been that their, their programming ability wasn't as good because there's some computer science people and other people in the other one. So it was very interesting to see that the students in the quote unquote lower level class did a much better job, much faster than the physics majors did. Cool. Let's hear about your life, Tony. Oh, okay. I, I haven't been out too much. Uh, just teaching a couple of classes here. Uh, I've been teaching university physics, which is a cloud based class and then uh, college physics, which is algebra based. And uh, I just added an extra one, astronomy. Uh, well, it's science 103. So I have all these three classes that I'm teaching. So it's uh, pretty busy. And uh, I am not doing uh, trinkets or <laughs> any of that stuff. Uh, I'm not doing trinkets, I'm not doing uh, glow script. I'm still with vPython. So I, I experimented a little bit with uh, uh, GlowScript and it didn't go too well. So I guess 
one of the other things was basically maybe I didn't have enough experience with GlowScript and I figured, well, there's no need to just make it a bad experience for them. Wait, so yeah. you, you yeah. were using classic vPython? Classic vPython. And you're not able to use, you had some bad experiences with Trinket or GlowScript? Mm -hmm. Not Trinket. I didn't. I never used Trinket at all. Okay. But, what happened? But there was a little uh, glow script. We just made one little error, and the students got frustrated about that. What was the error? It was mostly, uh, you know, when you're using VPython, you your vector. If you put a vector there, it's it's very clear that you you either have a vector or you don't. But sometimes we, uh, glow script is not going to tell you whether that's a vector or not, and that can be frustrating. So it wasn't a major thing, and my students weren't really that uh, frustrated, but it just felt easier to actually go back to classic vPython because it was already loaded in the computers. So, so I've been doing classic vPython for the past uh, couple of weeks, and uh, yeah, just the, the regular way that uh, most people do vPython is they they have little exercises. Uh, sometimes they have a minimally working program and they give it to students and they do it. Or alternatively, there are times when you, you have a program that can be handled in one class period, uh, like uh, modeling a car, car on a truck, you know, things like that. So you can do that within one class period and that's, that's okay. Or you can give a minimally working program that you keep uh, uh, that you add on and then an answer a couple of questions. And it's been going well. Uh, and uh, the students, I had a bigger class than I usually have, like 25 students. So the, the space was also an issue, but I've been, they've been working in groups of three or four, uh, sometimes in groups of two. And occasionally you get to hear them saying they like this vPython. But most of them are like, Tony is just making us do these things and we have to do it. So there's nothing we can do. But a couple students, at least five of them, seem to have uh, an understanding that this is good and that they like it. One, one of the students is a, is a girl who's uh, going into biochemistry. She likes coding and she loves that. And then there are, there are a couple of computer science people who like it too. Uh, but other than that, they just kind of keep going, you know. <laughs> uh, they're not too unhappy, but they're like, I wish I wasn't coding, but they know that they have to just do it because it's good for them. It's like eating vegetables. So what can you do? <laughs> so do you guys have any questions for me? Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that I, I think the error feedback on GlowScript and Trinket is really uh, not acceptable for student use because it's just really not very informative. You have to know a lot about what could potentially be wrong with your program to begin to make use of that error feedback. And I think it was, I don't remember what it was within classic vPython. I think Jupyter error feedback is, is the best. And so one thing that I have liked about using Trinkets is, I mean, I want students to use trinkets that almost work or, or work and they're just modifying them because then you can always reload it, right? And it will return to its working state or its original state, you know? <clears throat> but I don't, I don't think I want students who haven't been formally trained in Python to be writing code in a blank workspace in a trinket because it, it, would, be, it would be too frustrating, I think. So only one question I have for you just just quickly is uh, so so this semester you're using you're still you're using classic feed Python in the way you have have you been um, building any new activities or are you are you are you working with activities that you, you had in the past but what, what, what does that look like yeah I haven't been building any new activities whatsoever I just don't have time to build any <laughs> So I've used the, the older activities that I've had, uh, some of them borrowed from some guys who've used vPython for a while. Uh, and you're, you're familiar with them, some from, some from Georgia. And yeah, so I haven't really been able to, to make any new activities.
just modifying. Okay. Um, so again, I want to sort of be respectful of the time we had. We started a little bit late, and, and people had a lot to say, which has been great. Um, does anyone have any other comments or questions or things that we should um, bring up? Um, my, my plan is going to be to um, to sort of ask in the Slack channel what would be sort of the next kind of topic for folks to want to talk about um, uh, in maybe in the next month or so. Um, so we can do that sort of separately and maybe bring other people into the conversation. But I wanted to, to give some space to let people um, talk about anything else that they wanted to before we close out. Okay. Can you hear from everybody? Yes. I don't remember hearing from Larry. Larry's too much of an expert. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so Michelle, if you wanted to hear from me, I'm I'm actually doing similar to what you described this semester. I have I have intro calc based DNM, um, and we did uh, stuff uh, during the first portion of the semester where they were calculating uh, electric field by adding up lots of little bits of charges, um, and did that in Jupyter notebooks, um, and then uh, last week. Um, oh, they were doing charges in a conductor and uh, looking at the dynamics of charges in a conductor and how they end up on the surface in Gauss's law, um, which is pretty neat. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. I have, I have a question that maybe we can talk about later, but it's about spider. <clears throat> um, because um, my experience this semester with the Kinder and Nelson book that Danny linked is that we've been doing all of our work in spider because there's nothing <clears throat> There's nothing in VPython in that book, and that was just how the book directs you to do it. And it's been super enlightening to use Spider and to have the variable explorer in particular, because I just felt like we learned so much about how Python works. Like, just what is, what are the guts of what makes this work? And so I actually have a real understanding of what I should expect. You know, the program. Python and vPython are much less magic now than they used to be. Um, Spider is awesome. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Spider is awesome. The the debugger and variable explorer. Yep. Yeah. So I um, I just wanted to say that I I mean I don't know that I wish that it had been part of the workshop or that but I just want to throw that to the to the kind of pick up whoever the project management team is um, you know that just some feedback that for me, after the workshop, having that kind of experience through Spider was very beneficial. I, I think I did show Spider, but it, it was very brief. Um, I, you may not have been at that. That I think it was. In yeah, and I, I don't know if a brief exposure would help. Yeah. You know. Yep. It's, it's just a lot of a lot of playing around, and just we look at our data all the time, whenever we're making new programs, learning new things. Oh, what does this look like in spite in the variable explorer? You know? Yeah, cool. Um, I, I mean, we'll take note of that and see, uh, you know, there might be space for that in the next workshop. Um, okay, any other stuff? Cool. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now so I can start.